Hey, good morning, everybody. Hope everybody's well today. We're going to start off with everlasting God. Please stand to your feet as we sing this morning. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord our God. You reign forever, our hope, our strong deliverer. You are the everlasting God, the everlasting God. And you do not fail, you won't this morning say hi to somebody close to you and greet everyone please Wonderful. 
Jesus today and every day. We must have faith in him. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till
shall come with a trumpet sound. Oh, may I live in Him be found, dressed in His righteousness alone. Faultless to stand before the throne. sing in a moment. And Lord, we ask that you bless our voices and just proclaim the, the proclaim Christ to everyone that's in attendance today because that is who we aim to celebrate today. Lord, I pray for someone, if they don't know you today, Lord, I pray that they can get to know you. It's such an important decision. And so, Lord, I pray for each one in attendance. I pray for each one's salvation at this time. Lord, I also pray for Brother Steve, who's going to come up uh, moments after the choir, Lord, and then just whatever you have to say through him today, Lord, I pray that you have prepared him, and Lord, I pray that you speak through him today, whatever we would have to hear to become closer and closer in fellowship with Christ, the only one that can save us. And I pray all these things in the precious name of our Savior Jesus. Amen.
Father, we thank you uh, that in you alone we can stand in our Father's presence and be forgiven of our sins if we've accepted you as personal Savior. Father, we love you. And as this morning, as we open up your word, we would pray that um, you would be in charge of this service, not me, not uh, any member here, not anyone sitting in this congregation. That, Father, your spirit would not only comfort but convict. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you, uh, Paul. Uh, Paul, wherever you're at. Uh, there you are. Paul, for the invitation to be here. I was here several times over the years. I think the last time I was here was probably about maybe eight or nine years ago. Uh, but since then, I've retired, and somebody said, well, how do you like it? And I will tell you this, that I highly recommend it. And uh, I do. And uh, it, do I? Oh, I thought somebody said something. They were ready for that, too. And uh, look, every day is a holiday, twice on Sunday. And that's the way I kind of look at it. But thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. Uh, I would like for you to open your Bible to John chapter 19. We're going to take a different approach this morning than what I usually take. Sometimes most pastors will get up and they'll start out with an illustration or start out with something to kind of gain your attention. I want us to look at a passage of Scripture this morning found in John 19 and verses 28 through 30. We're going to key in on one portion of this today. And we're going to be talking about, uh, in, the, in the long term, our destiny or our purpose of why we are here. But we're going to focus on Christ and his destiny and his purpose. As we look back at the scriptures, many of us realize that as we study those, um, there are sometimes we find differences. How many of you have ever heard of the seven sayings of the cross? Okay, all of us have probably seen that. And if you go back and you look at that, if we want to refresh your memory for a minute, uh, just to kind of give you an idea, when Christ was on the cross, first of all, uh, we see the words, Father, forgive them. He was talking to all those that were putting him on the cross, those that were uh, the soldiers, those that were around him, but not only those, everyone, because of their sins, that put him on the cross. Then we see the words that today you will be with me in paradise. He was talking to uh, one of the, the thieves that were on the cross next to him, one of those that... Father, he said, Father, remember me. He said, today you'll be uh, with me in paradise. And then he looked at Mary, his mother. He said, woman, behold your child and or behold your son. And then there was the, the prayers or the words to his heavenly father where he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then we see he's here previous to these verses. He says, I thirst. The soldiers take a sponge with what some say are vinegar or sour wine or sour grapes or whatever you want to call it but it, he says uh, it is finished and then into the last one into thy hands I commend thy spirit I want to focus in on this sixth seven or sixth of the seventh sayings this morning where Christ says it is finished listen to these words out of John chapter 19 verses 28 through 30 it says later knowing that all, and I want to repeat that word again, all was now completed, and so that the scriptures would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, and so they soaked it on the sponge, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and they lifted it to Jesus' lips, and when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head, and he gave up the spirit. May I mention to this to you, first of all, I want us to kind of take us through a biblical study before we get to the main area of our message this morning or the main purpose of this. And I want you to think about this for a minute. Where is this one saying, it is finished, where is it found in the scriptures? Okay, I, that, I, I need some help here. Okay, uh, I'll tell you like I tell my Sunday school class that I teach each Sunday, uh, where is this passage where it says it is finished found is it found in any of the other gospels not this particular saying it isn't but there are similarities to that if we look at Matthew Mark and Luke and uh, the, the gospels or the parallel gospels is what many theologians call them we'll find similar words especially in Matthew 50 where it says Jesus cried again with a loud voice and he yielded up his spirit 
We see in Mark where Mark writes, and Jesus uttered with a loud cry. It didn't say uh, where Christ himself said it is finished and breathed his last. Luke mentions this. He says, in Jesus crying with a loud voice. Now why am I going through this, Steve? What, is, what does this have to do with what this passage is saying? Is it because sometimes many of us are, you're like the writers of the gospel. We hear something and then we give our side of the story of what we hear. And that's what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is about. Each one of them is writing or the writers of those gospels are telling their side of the story, what they saw, what they heard, what they thought was of an emphasis in this passage or at this particular time. Thinking about that for a minute, we know that different gospels have different accounts. Take, for example, in the book of John, we don't have uh, the genealogy of Jesus' birth. We don't have a lot about his childhood. We don't have a lot about the temptations. We don't have anything about the transfiguration and parables that he had talked about, the Great Commission. But yet John seems to center in on countless and many, many reminders of exactly who Christ was. And that's what I want us to think about this morning. If you were writing this passage of Scripture, if you had been there, John, and you will see that he was there, most theologians believe that he was there, and that he is a little bit different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke and, uh, in the writing of this. Now, what were the major differences? Well, first of all, if you were to kind of break these down and the Gospels themselves, Matthew was more focused on... Uh, uh, let's first of all talk about who was Matthew. What was his profession? Tax collector. So Matthew had a point where he's talking about Jesus and he's using more of a prophetic tone. He's talking about the prophecies being fulfilled and as Christ came on earth, he sees Messiah, Jesus as the Messiah and the King and how he, uh, if you want to go back to it, I believe, and I'm looking at some notes I have here, is that over 53 times he had made quotes of the Old Testament prophecies. And then over 76 times he had alluded back to the Old Testament prophecies and how in reference to the Messiah would be born. But most importantly, David saw, uh, excuse me, not David, Matthew saw Jesus as the son of David. Why is it important? Because it did fulfill the prophecy. It fulfilled the prophecy uh, that there would be uh, a new Messiah come. And that's what he did. And then in Mark, we see that he was the missionary associated with Paul. He wrote his letter mainly to the Romans. Well, how did he see Christ? He saw Christ as a suffering servant. We see that he related his scriptures and passages to Old Testament sayings as well. But he referred to Jesus as the Son of Man. And he was a healer. He was a miracle worker. Sometimes I've heard it said that Mark is the working man's gospel. Have you ever heard that? Uh, a lot of people would say, well, that's where you can go and you can see a working man's text or translation of the gospel. But Luke, Luke was a physician. He wrote it to the Greeks. And the Greeks were one of those things, or the people, uh, if you were to talk about it, they were more involved in the philosophies and the culture and the beauty and the presence of truth. They were more intellectual. So Paul, excuse me, uh, Luke is trying to get their attention to the gospel and draw emphasis of who Christ was. We've already seen where Matthew says he was the son of David, Mark, the son of man, and Luke, now he says he's the son of Adam. He's merciful, he's compassionate, he's prayerful, he's, he's a teacher. And he also gives special concerns to the women of the Bible. But then we see John. This is the only place where we see the words, it is finished. But what about John? Some say that he was one of the youngest disciples. Many theologians would argue that he was probably in his early mid-twenties when he was chosen to be a disciple or, or the disciple of Christ. And he later died on his, in his upper 70s, somewhere in his 80s. And, and that's debatable. I, I'm, I'm just giving you some things that I've studied and things that I've looked at. And I begin to understand well, why was that important? Because John, as he's telling this story, you notice that if you continue to read this a little bit earlier, John was there. He's giving his side of what he heard. But John, he's trying to do something else besides what Matthew, Mark, and Luke did. Matthew focused on the Jews. Mark focused on the Romans. 
Luke on the Greeks, but John focused on everybody. What about the passage of John 3.16, where he writes, For God so loved the world that what happened? He gave his son so that whoever, everyone, could have eternal life. So as you look at that, you see that John has more of a theological tone, but there's kind of something that interested me about this as he writes this. John, did you know what John's profession was? He was a fisherman. Now here's this fisherman that Christ chooses to be his disciple. He goes along with him, and then as he's witnessing the death of Christ, he hears these words, and he says, it is finished. Christ says, it's finished. John sees Christ as the Son of God. He's noble. He's powerful. And yet, in all four Gospels, and this is where I wanted to use this introductory part to share you all this with, it's kind of an unusual introduction, but in all four Gospels, and it bears down really in John, we see the emphasis to where Christ is in control of his destiny. How many of you have ever read the book uh, from Rick Warren, Purpose Driven Life? You remember that? Have you ever wondered what your purpose in life was? Sometimes I've done that. I've often wondered, have I fulfilled what God's purpose in my life was? Maybe you asked that. But John here, he sees that Christ, along with these other disciples, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, as they're writing the Gospels, when he comes to this point where Christ says, it is finished, I think he's focusing in on one thing, is that Christ, the fulfillment of his destiny. So here's a question for you this morning to begin with. What was Christ's destiny? Many of you could probably say that without any theological speech or talk. You could say, well, first of all, I believe all of us could say, based upon what we've seen through the life of Christ, when he said this, that knowing all, everything was completed, he said, it's finished. Well, when I think of the word finished, I think that there's no more to it. How many of you like banana pudding? Oh, come on, where's Dan at? Dan back there. I, I know he does. If you were to take that bowl of banana pudding, you start eating it, eating it, eating it, and there's no more left in the bowl, what are you going to say? It's gone. There's no more. It's all ended. It's over. It's kaput. There's no more. That, that's all there is to it. And that's what many of us think about the word of finished. But there's a little bit different twist here. When John uses this, and in, in as he's writing these words of Christ, when he said he bowed his head, he gave up the Spirit, and he did it willingly, not forcefully. He said it's his destiny to do so. He was in control of that. He chose to do that. He wasn't forced to do that. So to fulfill the prophecies of the Old Testament, which was a Messiah would come, he would be born in flesh, he would live among us, and then he would die on the cross for us. That's what this part means. It is finished means that the Messiah came. Now, I, I wanted to kind of think about this for a minute. As Why is that important? Well, up until this point, up until the crucifixion, usually man would make a sacrifice of a lamb or another animal, and they would put it in the altar, and they would offer it up to God, and they would offer it for their sacrifices for the sins. And it would be a substitute which enabled for them for God to accept that offering, and then they would be forgiven of their sins, and they would have a close encounter with God. That's kind of a, an easy way to put it. It's a different translation or a different way to put it. If we think about Christ, when he's offering himself, it's the Son of God. He is God. He's offering himself for us so that we can have eternal life. And I think about this as I looked at this passage of Scripture, and there's one thing that kept ringing out in my mind, is that regardless of how many sacrifices that man had made in the Old Testament, sin still continued. And they had to repeat their sacrifices. Guess what? Sin continues still today. We still continue to sin, but Christ, at this particular time, He came, He died on the cross for us, and he said, it's finished, it's complete. You don't need another sacrifice. I am the ultimate sacrifice for your sins. It's, it's all over. There's, need, there's not a need for another one. 
But you know what? Many people say, well, yeah, we have to have Christ plus something else. You ever heard that? Or I need to have this plus this. No, Christ said this is it. This is all that's been done. It's all been completed. It's over. I, uh, as most preachers do, they go through and they look up the definitions of words. How many of you are interested in definitions? Sometimes it's catchy. Well, I just so happened to look up and I said, what does the word finished mean theologically? Well, there's three different definitions that are used. One, and in the Old Testament and New Testament times, a merchant would come through and he would take and he would buy something and then as a receipt, they would write it on papyrus or papyrus and they would give it to him. And that would be said that you had paid the debt in full once you had paid for that product. Another example might be when a servant would come and uh, he would take his work and he would do it, he would complete it, and then he would go to the master and he'd say, it's finished, it's over. Uh, and the master would look at it, he would make sure that it's done, he would nod and reply to it, and he would respond, yes, it's finished, it's complete, there is nothing else to be done. And then the last definition of that would be uh, what a shepherd would use, where they would take the perfect lamb and then they would offer it, where they would say that my debt of sin is being paid in full. Now all of those combined, there's a Greek word which says tetelahai, tetelestai. And tetelestai simply means exactly what Jesus says. It's over, it's complete, it's finished. So when we see the writings of the gospel, whether it be Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, we know that the purpose of Christ coming to this world was to fulfill a prophecy that God had given the children of Israel in the Old Testament. The second thing, what did it do? It was his destiny not only to fulfill the prophecy, but also fulfill this, the work of redemption. Now, without going into a big theological explanation of this, let me just say that redemption, a good definition of redemption, is the idea of something being bought back or to repurchase something or to rescue something from ransom. Uh, many of us might refer to the book of Ruth, where Ruth was rescued, she was brought back, uh, she was helped out. And so, as you think about this for a minute, in Christ's redemptive act, when he said it's finished, there's no need for another redemptive act to be made. There's no need for another purchase for your sins. I've completed that. When he said, uh, he gave himself, and he, what he did in the last verse, he bowed his head, he gave up his spirit, he sacrificially gave himself as a ransom, a payment for our sin. So when I think about the words, it is finished, it was Christ's destiny, it was his purpose to do that. Ephesians 1 7 says this in him we have redemption we have the act of redemption it says through his blood and may I add this it was only through his blood that we have redemption the forgiveness of sins so let me read that all together in him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the seeker of God's grace. So we're being redeemed. We're being bought back through the blood of Christ. So that was his purpose also. I want to remind each of us that, first of all, we can't earn our salvation. You can't earn your salvation. I can't earn your salvation. You can't earn mine. But it was paid for by Christ's blood on the cross. We didn't deserve it. The mercy and grace that God showed us, He gave it to us freely. Christ substituted Himself freely on the cross that we could have eternal life. So what is your purpose? When we look at this passage of Scripture and we read it, a lot of people would read this and say, well, it's done. That's all there is. Um, yeah, he was a prophet. He was an individual. But it's over. 
it's done. There's nothing else. I like what Charles Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon lived in the middle of the 1800s, late 1800s, as he wrote many times scriptural sermons, messages, passages. Uh, as I was going through some research of this, I began to find out some things that I was reading what Spurgeon had to say about this. And let me just share some things, an insight of someone who lived in the early 1800s. And let's see if it applies to us today. First of all, he said that yes, Christ came. His destiny was to fulfill the prophetic prophecies of the Old Testament. He came in his perfection to finish it. Not only that, he arrived as a sacrifice for us, as the prophets talked about. And when he gave of himself, he abolished this idea that we would ever have to sacrifice anything again. But there's something else I think is very important. Not only was it Christ's destiny to fulfill the Old Testament prophecies, not only was it to fulfill the act of redemption, I like what Spurgeon talked about here when he said, also it was his destiny to defeat death on the cross. I'm reminded of the passage in the, in the New Testament where Paul talks about, O death, where is thy sting? Where is thy victory? If we think about this for a minute, there is no victory in death anymore because Christ overcame it at the cross. Sin was nailed to the cross with Him. He took our sins, your sin, my sin, and it was nailed on the cross. And when He said, it's finished, He said, I did it for you. He did it for me. Not only that, I think sometimes when we read these words, how many of you, uh, now how many of I, I don't want to, don't punch your husband, wives, but how many of your husbands are good listeners? Okay, I saw some bad looks there. All right, husbands, how many of your wives are, are good listeners? Well, we could, we could talk a lot about that. But, uh, you know, sometimes we hear the words of the gospel. We listen to what the words of the Bible say, but we don't really hear them. We hear them, but we don't listen to them. We read what they say, but we don't apply them. Because we've talked about, many of you, if you've been in church for a long period of time, you've heard about the prophecies proven true. You've heard about the redemptive act of Christ on the cross. You've heard about him defeating death on the cross. But what about this? Do you know that when he died on the cross, he, Jesus Christ himself, when he died, he had an effect of not only those that are going to heaven, but also those that are going to hell. You say, how, what, how in the world does that apply? Well, when you go to, we're guaranteed as long as we have a personal relationship with Christ, he, you can bank on it. With Christ's redemptive act, with his sacrificial act of fulfilling the Old Testament prophecies, his death on the cross, when he says it's, it's finished, he said he provided us a way of eternal security in heaven with Christ. But yet if you don't know Christ, he also provided something for you. There's not another opportunity for that individual who's died without Christ that they could pass from one area to the other and have this relationship with Christ once they've rejected him. So as I thought about that, I thought about this. What do we do when we hear the gospel? When we hear that Christ said it's finished, what do we do with it? When we hear about him fulfilling the Old Testament prophecies, we read it in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We see the seven sayings of the cross, and then we know that it's over. What do we do with it? Well, we're challenged to proclaim it, to shout it out, to tell each other about it, and to tell others about it. And we're to profess that, yes, it's finished, but guess what? It's not over. Now, here's an interesting point. You remember I said when that banana pudding bowl, all of it's empty, it's gone, that's it? There's something you need to know about the death of Christ on the cross. He fulfilled the prophecies. He became the redeemer. He defeated death on the cross. But in one sense, it's not finished. You know why? Because the prophecies tell us that he's coming back. He's coming back for those that believe in him, his bride, the church. He's coming back for us. 
And folks, let me tell you something. Uh, he, fulfilled his, he fulfilled his destiny. He fulfilled his prophecy, but he's going to even fulfill it more when he comes back. Philippians tells us that every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that he is Lord. Whether you've read the book of Purpose Driven Life or Rick Warren or not, whether you know what the purpose in your life is or not, I want to challenge you to ask yourself this. What is my destiny? What is your destiny? What is this church's destiny? What is its future? Now, I know you don't have a pastor, but let me tell you something. I've been in a lot of churches that didn't have pastors. And some of the most thriving, growing times for a church is when you don't have a pastor. You say, you're nuts. No, I'm not kidding you. Because it relies, what happens is the disciples of Christ, we as the body of Christ have to step up and step out in faith and reach our final destiny of who we are as a church. Do you want your church to grow? Do you want your church to thrive? Christ is calling us the body of Christ today to reach our fulfillment of the destiny he's already lived out. It's to proclaim the gospel, to reach out to others and let them know that yes, he did come, but he's coming back. He's coming back. I think if we understood the scriptures even more, and it's very clear that Christ finished the work of the prophecies of the Old Testament, yes. He finished his Father's work on the cross but there's more to come. So closing today, what is your destiny? When you read the scriptures, whether it be Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, and you read in one passage where, golly, this guy's saying this, this one's saying this, what's it all about? How do you resolve those things? Do you continue to study in his word? Or do you just push it aside and say, man, that's all there is. I would challenge you. Take the words of the Bible. Take the words that God's given us. Not only just take them and read them, but act upon them. Act upon them so that we as a body of Christ, a body of believers, can reach our fulfillment of our destiny. If we're the bride of Christ, are we living like it? If you're part of the bride of Christ, are you living like it? We have a destiny to complete on this earth, but also we have an eternal destiny. And that eternal destiny relies on our reaction to God's call. In closing, I want to ask you a very simple question. And I didn't use a whole lot of illustration, different things today, and that was on purpose. When Paul called me, this was the first passage of Scripture that came to my mind. It is finished. It is finished. Guys, we've still got work to do. Christ died on the cross so that you can have a relationship personally with him. He fulfilled the Old Testament. He fulfilled the act of redemption. He defeated death. He provided a way for us to go to heaven. Now it's your turn to make a decision what you're going to do about it. Let's pray. Father, we love you. As we look at your word this morning, we understand that it's not only hearing God's word, that sometimes it's responding to it that matters most. And until our time on this earth ends, Father, it's not finished for us. We have work to do. Father, I, just looking at these verses again where you said, knowing... John writes this, knowing that all, all was completed. You uttered the words, it is finished. And freely, you bowed your head and you gave your life for us. Father, this morning, may we understand that our destiny depends on our decision of what we do with you. In Christ's name, amen. Now, I don't know about you and your personal relationship with Christ, but I do know this. Sometimes we assume too much. We assume that the person next to us is a Christian 
and we assume that they know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. I'll tell you this short story, and then I'll close and sit down because I know sometimes most Baptists, when it gets close to 12, you're ready to go eat, but I'm going to tell you this anyway. I remember being in a class, of evangelism class one time, and I had a friend of mine, and our assignment was to go out on the streets of Alexandria and Pineville to witness and share scripts and scriptures and tracts and things, and this one guy sat there and he said, I'm not doing that. God didn't call me to do it. I'm not doing that. There's no way that'll reach anybody for Christ. So he went home mad that weekend. The professor told him, look, that's part of your assignment. If you don't do it, you'll fail the course. He went home. He's sharing with his wife. He's going through that with his wife. He's sitting at the table with her. Little did he not know, even though he had been married to his wife about six years, she had said she was a Christian, but as he began to share the gospel tracts with her, he began to find out that she didn't know Christ. He had an opportunity to lead her to the Lord. Don't ever assume. Don't ever assume anything. Witness to those that are in your family. Witness to those that are in your church body. Because, guys, listen to me. Our destiny, your destiny, our destiny of your loved ones depends on them knowing Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. An invitation is times for you personally to, to make a decision about what you're going to do with Christ. What are you going to do with it? It's not over, guys. It's not finished. He's coming back. Will you be part of the bride of Christ that he comes for? Let's stand. Save you now. 